Makers Music Nerds, and welcome to Season 6 of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. I am your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm really excited to be bringing you this new season of shows coming to you on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. I have a great lineup of fascinating conversations with incredible musicians, songwriters, guitarists, steel guitarists, drummers, composers, who knows what else. I've been having an incredible time diving deep with these folks and I know you're going to enjoy listening. Just a reminder that this year I've taken out the short song samples through the show, as things have gotten way more complicated as far as legal use of music goes, so I'll be making an accompanying Spotify playlist to each episode, which you'll find in the episode's show notes and at the website at makersandshakerspodcast.com. So anytime you hear this cute little slide guitar sound, you'll know there's a track to go along with it on the playlist. We have some new sponsors this year, but continue to be largely listener supported. Your help in keeping the show going is always appreciated, and you can do it with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription. Patreon is a monthly payment of your choice, and when you sign up for that, you get a bit of added content as well as an ad-free version of the show to listen to. If you don't feel like kicking in any dough, that's cool too, but you can help by subscribing for free on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just spread the word by sharing the show, following us on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and telling all your pals about it. You can get links to all this stuff, of course, at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, many thanks to our sponsors this season. Please check them out and let them know that I sent you. They are Isotope, Ear Trumpet Labs, Union Tube and Transistor, Black Mountain Picks, and Spectra 1964. Hey everybody and music nerds, happy new year. This is episode number 136 of the show. Oh yeah. I hope everyone had a safe and groovy little holiday. Thank you so much, all you listeners out there, for the messages and the Apple reviews that you sent my way the last couple of weeks. That stuff really helps the cause. And lots of good ideas came in on future guests that you'd like to hear from, too, in upcoming seasons. I like that we're on the same wavelength here, people. So this is episode 136, and my guest today is an incredible singer and songwriter and performer, originally from the Bay Area, but now just lives a few blocks away from me here in Nashville, Nikki Bloom. So it's 2023. It's shaping up to be a pretty good year, I think. I have a bunch of sessions and production work coming up here in Nashville, which is nice. Not enough live gigs at this point for me, but hoping that'll change as we get going here. Sometimes it does. I will be touring with my band, though, in April, which ought to be fun. I'll keep you posted on those dates as we get closer to that. And there's a few annual things that I do now, and I'll be doing again this year. That includes a stint in Vancouver in the fall for a show, a few shows. And the Hen House Hang recording camp will be held here in Nashville, September 25th through 28th, right after Americana Fest this year. There's a few spots left for that. So if you want to take part and learn some stuff about recording and come hang for a few days, it's going to be a blast. So you can get info on that whole thing over at stevedawson.ca. For anyone that missed the last episode, there are five more shows coming this season, including today's. And that'll be followed by a little break while I get season seven prepped. And then we'll be launching that sometime in the spring this year as well. And lastly, just a quick shout out to a couple of supporters this last couple of weeks who kicked in with um, one-time donations or Patreon subscription. Thank you so much. That is greatly appreciated. And I couldn't do it without you. They are Mike Fair and my old buddy Don Rook. He's from Toronto. He's a wicked lap steel player. He's got a band called The Henrys. You should all go and listen to The Henrys. Check them out. All right, so this week on the show, we have Nikki Bloom. I heard her recent record, Avondale Drive, about six months ago, and I was totally blown away by it and pleasantly surprised to find that she lived really close by. So Nikki swung by in between some tour dates, and we had a good old conversation that you'll be hearing in a minute. Um, she's been out on tour with Little Feet recently. She sings back up and sings a couple songs with their live show, and I think she'll be doing that again in the spring. She's made a bunch of killer records on her own, and she's just got a really powerful and soulful voice that I dig. Her latest album, as I mentioned, is called Avondale Drive, and she's got another solo record called To Rise, You've Got to Fall, and then a few with her old band called The Gramblers, which is a band that she fronted with her ex-husband and Mother Hips member Tim Bloom. These days, she tours with a great band and sometimes as a duo with her new partner, Jesse Wilson, who she made this new album with during the pandemic. It was fun to hang and great to get to know her a little bit, and I think you'll enjoy getting to know her as well through this conversation right now. Just a reminder to check the accompanying Spotify playlist to hear a bunch of her music and some of the other music that we talk about on the show. And you can keep posted with Nikki 
all of her upcoming tour dates and new releases, if there are any, and all that stuff at NikkiBloom.com. All right, let's get down to it. Enjoy my conversation with Nikki Bloom. So this was a COVID project for you, I guess. It was, yeah, it was a COVID project. We actually started recording just out of sheer, like, boredom. You know, Jesse and I were talking. Jesse and I were living together at the time and still are, but... um, he and I were... This is Jesse Wilson, Yeah, correct? this is okay. Jesse Noah Wilson. Um, he and I were living together, and, you know, it was sort of just, like, this endless unknown of, like, when are we going to get in the studio? When are we going to get in the studio? And it was like, let's just start recording demos. He had kind of converted a bedroom area. This is still pre-COVID? This is, yes. No, this is 2020. This is, like, early 2020. So when, you hadn't started the process no, yet? But no. But you had a group of songs? Had it like 20 songs and were basically kind of like, I was ready to record, you know, I, yeah. I, I had a deliver a li- delivery to, to Compass I needed to make and I just was like ready to make it happen. And he's like, let's just start recording demos. He'd kind of like made a little home recording area in one of the bedrooms at the house and we were just going to make demos so that when we could get into the studio, it was like we were ready to go. And we started making demos, and it was just kind of like, well, this is actually pretty cool. Like, yeah. this is cool. And then, you know, it'd be like, well, let's like let's send this track to, to Richard uh, Melsap, which is Jesse's brother-in-law. He was set up, you know, to play drums in L.A. And so we, like, floated the track to, to Richard, and he recorded drums and sent it back to us. And that's kind of when we just discovered this process of, like, remote recording, which we've all become incredibly familiar with now, post-COVID, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that it actually works and it's pretty effective and pretty fun because, you know, you give this allowance to people you trust and, you know, you get back um, their interpretation of your song, which is really cool without a lot of, like, instruction, you know, which is nice. And, and they have to be creatively minded going into it, too, because they don't necessarily hear very much at the time that they're working on the song, too, right? Totally. Totally. You know, it could be maybe, like, acoustic and scratch vocal or something. So you're right, yeah. They're definitely... It made it really fun and collaborative because they became really deeply part of the process. And, you know, it was just sort of one of those silver linings of the time because everybody was stuck at home and everybody was creatively starved and everybody was, like, isolated and wanting to collaborate and wanting to commune and this was a way to do it safely. And um, and nobody was touring. So it was like, you know, people who would typically be on the road, Oliver Wood, Carl Denson, Jay Belleros, Jen Condos, like these people who we would normally not be able to pin down were very accessible because nobody could tour. And into it. And into it. Yeah, these are all old friends of mine, old family friends of Jesse's. His family is like deep music family, and, um, you know, Jay Belarus is like his uncle, so... What? Yeah. Really? Yeah, his parents, uh, Teresa James and Terry Wilson, they're like incredibly accomplished life musicians. And that's his parents? That's Jesse's parents, yeah. So he sort of has So what's all their these, relation? Um... In what way? To Jay Belleros. Oh, they're just old friends. Um, Jay plays drums. Teresa James and the Rhythm Tramps are a great band out of L.A., and Jay plays drums with them okay. when he can. Um, Jen Condos and Teresa have a band uh, called Queen Cake together in L.A. And, um, okay. Yeah, just, you know, years and years of being in the music business and living in L.A. Yeah, so Jay and and Jen worked on records for me too at nice. the same time, so I know the I know the exact feeling of. So they they were like a pretty formidable team, I think. Except that Jen actually didn't like doing it. Like she, now that it's over, she, I don't think she ever wants to see a microphone again in her life. Yeah, I mean, but, I I had to go to LA when they were still set up, and it was just really cool to see their yeah. setup, like that big you know outdoor patio umbrella in the middle of their living room with Jay's drums, you know, they sent under me photos. it. Yeah, it was pretty cool, and you know, I guess Jay buys Jen a microphone every Christmas. So okay. like their locker of mics is extensive, yeah. and they could finally put it to use. And I think Jen just felt pressure of like. You know, she's not a recording engineer, but she had to become one. And she did a great job. She did a great job. She did an amazing job, yeah. you know. But, but she was really self-deprecating about it. And 
pretty insecure about her, her results, but they were amazing. They're amazing. Really. Yeah. And super vibey. And yeah, they weren't like a traditional thing at all, but Jay is not a traditional drummer. So totally. I think it, she had a, I mean, she has such a good handle on what he does and they communicate well in the regards of like Jay can just communicate what his needs are for like a particular song where he might be doing something particularly weird. Totally. She can figure out how to deal with that. Totally. They have like a, a deep intimacy musically and yeah. all, obviously personally too, but I think that all translates and lends to both, yes. you know, dynamics. So when, so, and Jen played bass on your record. She did. Any track that Jay's on, Jen played bass on. Okay. Um, and when she does the bass, does she re record it or does Jay jump over and take over the <laughs> That's a good question. I'm kind of assuming she probably took the reins, but I don't yeah. want to, you know, take away credit from Jay, so. Yeah, although I can't picture him doing that, but I wondered if he flipped around and helped her out or not. Yeah, I'm not, not sure. For me, it was like a giant Christmas present most mornings where I'd wake up and there'd be a thing from Jay and Jen from some, some of them were like, I sent them some weird stuff. I was doing like an instrumental record at the time that was pretty spacey and weird. And he just went to town on that stuff. And it was like really layered and textured. And he had tons of percussion. Like he took his time and did a bunch of cool stuff. It was really yeah. great. Yeah. He's, and you're right. He's there's so no way that would have happened in normal <laughs> situations. Like I've done records with him in person before. But yeah, I mean, it's always like pretty quick. And yeah. I think the more time was taken. Yeah. Totally. Self-producing, he's probably just like, ooh, this would be cool. Oh, this would be cool. You, they, you know, you're allowed this freedom to really just like explore your own mind and what you would do, which yeah. is cool. So when you're dealing with all these different people sending tracks out, how instructive were you being about what you were looking for? Not really at all. I mean, that's the, the benefit of having you know, really accomplished musicians who you admire and trust, it's like you kind of don't want to give them any direction. You just want them to be them. Right. You know, it was mostly like, just do you. Just do your thing. Maybe mm. we'd give like a song reference of like a feel, you know. Okay. Um, but, you know, the only things that we kind of had to get a little bit more specific on were songs that had really strange time signature changes, like Juniper Woodsmoke or Feel, where it was, was just like... Those, right, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of just like a little bit instructive on... You know, the deal. technicality of that. Yeah. Did you, so on tunes like that where normally like in a recording situation, you might just kind of like eyeball each other and be able to navigate something like that in real time. But in this case, were you like cutting those chunks of songs up into separate chunks or something? Or how did you deal with No, that? like a song like Feel, I mean, Jesse and Richard play together all the time and Richard played on feel. What does Richard play? Um, Richard plays drums. Oh, okay. Richard Millsap is a great drummer. Oh, okay. Um, they were in the band of Heathens together. Right. And now they both play in John Fogarty's band together. Mm. The two of those guys, Richard Millsap and Jesse Wilson. Okay. Um, and they're just like an amazing rhythm section. So they sort of have like this familiarity just of playing for so many years together yep. and their brother-in-laws and um, they just could kind of like communicate through the wires, you okay. know, in a way. Yeah. Um, and anything, any rub that like felt, you know, not quite there, we were able to just sort of like smear right. a sound on and just <laughs> smooth it out, you know. Yeah. And I give a lot of credit to Steve Christensen, who mixed the record. Um, okay. He's amazing. He's done like all the Krungbin records. And he's Where's a, he? He's in Texas. I think he's in Houston. He's in Houston. Um, Houston or Dallas? Houston. Um but, uh, yeah, and they're all friends with each other, too. So okay. it was just... It was a big friend fest. Yeah, big friend fest, yeah. Uh, how involved did you get in the mixing process? Not very. Jesse went out to Texas. Um, I did not. I don't remember why. I think I had some, probably some, like, animal situation to deal with at home or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Okay. And, you know, I think with mixing, if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, it just is not beneficial. So I, I trust those guys implicitly. And it was, you know, I think Jesse was there for a week and then Steve maybe spent, you know, three or four more days doing it. And mm -hmm. we called it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the sound of it, like the sonics of the record are really cohesive. Was that a tricky thing to accomplish with sending out tracks and doing the mixing, not being there and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I wish Jesse was here to answer that question because he really took the reins on that being the producer and Steve. Um, but it seemed 
you know, it seemed, I don't remember anybody tearing out their hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I don't really mind not being involved so much in the mixing process. I mean, I was I was listening to roughs and I was listening to mixes and I was yeah. listening as they developed and I gave my notes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, just getting getting Steve Christensen to mix it, it was like, I like what he does, you know. So it and, wasn't a stretch. Right. Yeah. So what was your actual process? I find that the whole remote recording thing pretty fascinating because people did approach it differently. And you play guitar. You also play some keys, right? No, I actually don't play. I do write on guitar and keys, okay. but I let um, better performers <laughs> Is track. it Kai? Played uh, Kai record. Welch played keys on some songs. Jesse Wills. Jesse played all over the record. I okay. mean, he plays everything. Everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I kind of let. Uh, so where do you know him from? So Jesse and I met actually during Americana Fest in 2018. Okay. Um, I was playing one of those tributes at the Basement East. Mm -hmm. um, and I was singing on stage. I was singing Tammy Wynette's D-I-V-O-R-C-E, <laughs> yeah. which I had just come off of a divorce of my own. It was sort of like this, you know, end rap of like, it, meant it was inter It meant something. Yeah, I got off the stage, and he was standing side stage, and he was just really friendly. He's like, "Hey, you need anything?" I was like, "Actually, I do. I'd love a PBR." <laughs> and he got me a PBR, and we just kind of kept the rest is history. hanging out, and the rest is history. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, so thanks, cool. Basement East. Yeah, yeah, that's a good scene there. I like that whole vibe they do during Americana. They're yeah. Proactive. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. It is. Uh, okay, so you were living together at the time, like during COVID. Well, we weren't going to. So Jesse at the time was living in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. And I was living out here, and he moved out to Nashville, like, February 2020. And he Tell got me. a room at Kai Welch's house. He was living oh. at Kai's house. Okay. Because we were, you know, being smart about not rushing into things. Right. And um, I underwent a surgery March 3rd. My mother flew out from the West Coast. And that night, March 3rd, the tornado hit. Oh, right. And Jesse and my mom were taking care of me. I was in the hospital for about a week. We came home post-tornado. And then COVID came. So we all ended up like living together for a month. My mom, With your mom, my new boyfriend, <laughs> and who had just moved to town. Oh my god! And I was just, you know, on painkillers. I had had, you know, open abdominal surgery. Oh I was god. like totally out of it. Um, and then, yeah, my mom was kind of stuck, and you know, Jesse didn't really want to keep going back and forth yep. from Kai's house to my house and exposing right. people. Yeah. So by default, we just sort of started living together. Um, <laughs> That's a funny way yeah, to, funny way to ha have that happen. Yeah. Oh my God. It was an action packed kickoff to the pandemic. Whoa. How long did your mom stay with you? She w ended up being here, I think, a month. Um, wow. Okay. You know, but it was like stressful because it was like, is she going to get out? Are the airlines going to close? Yeah. I remember her talking to the airline agent and being like, if you want to get on a plane, do it sooner than later because we yeah. don't know what's going to happen. I was on tour that week too. Like, that's, I was out with the, we were opening for the Wood Brothers, and we got to Oregon. We were actually headed to that little town in Washington where everything started, whatever it's called. Oh. It's some weird city. <clears throat> with Ed and, there was an old folks' home that had the first COVID outbreak in America, and we were going there to play a gig. It was some private gig or something, and that never happened. Oof. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. So you're here. You're holed up. How long was it before you started thinking, hey, we should make a record? Um, I think it was probably beginning of summer 2020, and I was still kind of writing at that time. I mean, the the amount of time that I spent writing probably spanned from about 2018 to 2020 to 2020, so about two-year period. Mm -hmm. But I was still kind of writing into the summer. Um, like the last ones that I wrote were like Sweet Surrender and Wheels Rolling. Um, but yeah, it, and again, you know, we thought when we started, we were making demos and it just sort of organically became something that we thought was good enough to use and, 
And so we were sort of surprised that the process was working as well as it was. So how much of the tracks that you were sending out to people to play on were you actually keeping? Or were you getting stuff back and then like redoing your stuff? This is where um, everyone kind of like has different yeah. approaches. Yeah. I mean, so we did have three full days in a an actual studio at the end where I sang all my all my vocal tracks. Oh, okay. And we did some overdubs. Yeah. And I was able to sing with Oliver Wood yeah. on Friends and AJ Croce on Love Despair just so we could like do the du- duets in person. It's just cool. so much better. Yeah. Um, did you do the Oliver stuff at his place? Overall? No, we did it all at Compass Records. Okay. Yep, so that's Music the, Row. That, that's the <clears> studio, <throat> which, what's it called? It's called Compass Records, and it they're also Compass. my record label, yeah. Is that the one that they did, like, John Hartford Aeroplane Records? They may the have. Name? I know that that building has a lot of history, and it's a lot of, like, the old outlaw country guys used to be in that building. I think that's the one. Yeah, I, I've done a couple sessions there. And okay. It's like, that's, yeah, it's like the offices downstairs, yeah. upstairs studio, yeah. big control room. And they used to do, <clears throat> we did an interview there, too, for Bluegrass. That makes sense. Except, or whatever it was. I can't remember what the show was, but yeah. 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 It's a cool studio. It is. So that was provided to you by the label, and you got to go in there. and. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, it was great. It was nice. It felt really good to get in real person yep. time, mm-hmm. you know. So you read it all. You recut all your vocals there. Yep. And what else did you do in those last few days? Um, I think Kai played a bunch of keys, and you know we did a bunch of BGVs, um, overdubs, maybe some guitar, but but not really much. I mean, those three days really were dedicated to vocals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How do you approach sing? Like the vocal sound is great on that. You sing really well. Is it? How do you approach actually singing in the studio when you when you know you've got sort of a finite time? It's like the end of the process. Um, do you like that doing it that way? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked that because I had just come off of doing a session in LA. Um, this really strange. A gig, which was basically being a vocal stunt double for a television show. Oh, really? That's going to be like a musical television show. Yeah. And Blake Mills is doing the music, and yeah. I went in for three weeks and worked with Blake on yeah. creating this like character. Um, wow. And we had about I don't know fifteen, twenty songs that I was to sing as this character. And this is a in-person dramatic show or like an animated show? No, this is is, is an in-person. So the okay. lead of the of the show is not necessarily um, like a singer first. Okay. She's an actress first. Yeah. She can sing, but they wanted to lay down like uh, vocal tracks that she could practice to. And, oh. you know, okay. whether they may use them or not, I still haven't heard. Are, are you That's allowed how to say TV what the show is. is? I don't think I should. Okay. But maybe we can put it in the notes if I get allowance <laughs> or something like that. Um, but anyway. Uh, so you are singing. I'm singing. The actress is pretending to sing. Yes. Or is singing on top of your track. That's with, yet to um, be known. My okay. job at the time was to lay down tracks for her to listen to and learn from. Okay. So when I was doing that, and and Blake is so particular and specific um, it was really fun to work with him because normally I would go in to a recording session and just sing, just be me. Mm-hmm. And it was really fun to go in and sing and be somebody else. Like he's very specific and he had very good, he's a really great vocal producer mm-hmm. in that he'd be like, can we make it sound a little bit like more like this? Try scrunching your face. Try frowning when you're singing this song. Just He gave me all these like different techniques I'd never tried before to mm-hmm. make my voice sort of like altered in different ways and it just made me and we'd spend like a full day on one singing one song and it was like I didn't know you could spend that much time singing a song yeah and um, it just really put that like idea in my head that vocal production is really important and it's really important to spend time singing your songs Uh you know it's fun to just do off the cuff you know I always think like well Aretha Franklin she just does it all in one take and it's all the (laughs) tape and you know and it's Uh like yes the organicness of it is good and when you're as good as Aretha that's super awesome and amazing and I'm sure she's also had sessions where she spends longer but my point is it was the first time I had really thought of spending time tracking my vocals instead of just like throwing it down. So that's actually why 
I grabbed Kai to get into the studio with me for those three days at Compass because I feel like he and Blake actually are similar in mm-hmm. their like attention to detail. Mm-hmm. And Kai is such a great singer and he has such great like um, feel for like what, you know, emphasis to put on this word or that. And that was what I loved about Blake too. Like putting emphasis differently on one word can change the whole feel of a song. Totally. Like Sweet Surrender, it was sung, the chorus was sung totally different. And Kai was like, what if you push this instead? And it became this whole different song, you wow, know? that's cool. So... Like after it had all been tracked. Yeah. Just in the delivery. Yes. So cool. Yeah. So it just really kind of allowed me, working with Blake um, for that television show, allowed me to kind of like indulge in mm-hmm. my own process of recording vocal tracks. I think that I'd always been like, oh, I can be last, you know, whatever. I'll just throw it down. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, no. It's okay to spend time tracking your vocals. That's so cool. You know. Um so give me the give me a rundown on how you would actually do it then. So would you do like five passes and comp them or would you just sit there and sort of labor over a line until you had it perfect and then move on or what with was, Blake? No, no, no. Or this, with Kai and, with Kai and Jesse on this new record. Yeah, I mean it just depends like um leaving me is the loving thing to do. It's the ballad that yep. James Pennebaker just crushes the solo on. Mm-hmm. I sang that three times. Top and to top to bottom, yeah. and I think we chose the last one, and maybe grabbed a line from the first take or something like and that. And you're involved in that process. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You, okay. Yeah. There's still stuff, vocal stuff on the record where there's one thing where I'm just like, Ugh, you know, I'd love to go back and fix. But there's also, you know, like the time comes when you're like, okay, it's just done. Yeah. You know. I'll say. Um, uh, but, but so what? About, what's another example of one that would have been more intensive than that? Um, let me think. Feel was kind of strange and a little bit hard just for the timing, you know? Right. Like, I, it's the most simple song on the record, <laughs> but the timing of it was, like, that was probably the most challenging one for me because we were also sort of crunched for time. We had three days to do all ten songs, and um, I get easily frustrated with myself, but that oddly as simple as the song is was probably the hardest one for me to just get the feel of Mm -hmm. and then once i once i get something so was that just a matter of repetition for you okay yes you just had to sing it a gazillion times yeah i probably sang that i mean not a gazillion but i probably you know i probably touched that one you know 10 to 15 times yeah top to bottom again or do you sit there and like hit lines after um I mean, I usually will sing through stuff, you know, at least a few times. And then if we need to go back and grab lines, I can do that. Um, But I I do like to have an organic cohesiveness to the take, especially that's why it was so cool in in Leaving Me is a Loving Thing to Do, because it's so emotional. Mm -hmm. And it was such a like moment for me just... Being in that, I didn't really want to grab and patchwork it together. So I how did you do it. that one? That one was just straight. You live. know, yeah, yeah. Just you? Uh, no, actually, no. Kai sings BGVs on that. Um, he and actually, Aaron Ray sings on that too. She sings BGVs oh, okay. on that. Yeah, yeah. So the so in those three days, that you thing. did those all the all the backup vocals as well. The Kai's stuff. Aaron did hers Aaron. remotely. Okay. Did you have those done before you? done the final vocal? No. Oh, okay. No, I think I sent it to Aaron after Kai and I had already You completed, you'd yeah. signed off, sent yep. it to Aaron, said yep. have at her. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about a song like Feel. Carl Denson's on that. Yes. What's your, his, like, do you have a history with him of some I sort? I do. I have a deep history with Carl. I've known him for so long. Um, I actually sang on his record, like, I don't know, three or four records ago. Okay. Um... How did I first meet Carl? I don't so even remember. So you're kind of like tied into the jam scene yes. in an unusual way for a singer-songwriter. Yes, it's because of my association probably with Phil Lesh. Um, What's your association with Phil Lesh? I play with Phil a bunch when he does his Phil and Friends stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm from San Francisco. Yeah. I'm actually from the East Bay, but I spent many years living in San Francisco and okay. Marin County. And Phil had a great venue and restaurant called uh, Terrapin, Terrapin, Cross, Terrapin Crossroads. Had? He doesn't have it anymore? No, it sadly closed. Oh. It was open for about 10 years. But um, when, he, when he launched that first week, he played... Uh, 
you know, every night for, I think, like, 10 days. And I was part of that opening oh, wow. band. Okay. Yeah. It was, like, me and Chris Robinson and, and my hus- husband at the time, Tim, and I think Ross James and Graham Lesh. And, I know Graham a little bit. We yeah. We played together. He's there. great. Yeah. I love Graham. Um, but, yeah, so so that relationship you know, began that was your in initial County. relationship with him? Or? I think no, I think it predated that. I think I met Phil originally through my friend Jackie Green, um, who had us both up. He was playing the Fillmore and I think the first time I met Phil was when we were both sitting in with Jackie as guests. Okay. And I just remember standing next to Phil and being like <laughs> My Still brother is going to think I'm so cool. <laughs> I have two older brothers, yeah. and one of them is a huge deadhead. So that was kind of a cool moment for me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then, the you know, um, it's just, it's been a, a really fun journey with Phil. I mean, I just respect and admire him so much, and I love playing with him. And, you know, and then I would go on jam cruise and, you know, okay. do the, all the festivals, um, you know, so Jam whenever he does festivals. Phil and Friends, you're in that? Not No, he changes it up. Okay. So it just depends. Like, we just did a bunch. Um, it was Dawes and me and Phil and Graham. We did a few shows at the Brooklyn Bowl here in Nashville. Um, we just did Asbury Park. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, and it hasn't been announced yet, but we have some dates coming up. Okay. So, you know, it, it's just you get the call and you do it because it's Phil. And so fun. what's the material when you do those shows? Grateful Dead. It is. Yeah. All Dead. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't seen one of those Phil and Friends thing, but I would like to. Oh, yeah, they're fun. I mean, if you like those songs, it's just, oh, sure. it's it's so fun. And then when you hear, you know, I've done it in many different renditions, but doing it with Dawes is really fun because they're all just, like, so pro and they're such great singers. And it's so fun yeah. for me as a singer to sing with them because mm-hmm. the harmonies are just, like, so lush and full. And right. It's it's a special combination. Coming from the San Francisco music scene, were you was the dead a big part of your life? Totally. It was. Of course. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I had an older brother who was like the coolest person in my life and that's basically all he listened to. So <laughs> I sort of got some early schooling which helped, you know. It helps having an older brother deadhead sometimes. Yeah, it yeah. does. It does. And just in the area, I mean, that's just like what people listen to. You yeah. know, it's just kind of constantly on boyfriends that I had, um, you know. What's your favorite kind of era of the dead? Or do you I, like it all? Um, I mean, I loved when Pig, Pig Pen was alive because the I love stuff. the blues yeah. stuff. I love Pig Pen's voice. Yeah. Easy Wind is like one of my favorite songs and I love doing it. I love when Phil puts that on the set list because okay. it's so fun to sing. Yeah. Um, I love Working Man's Dead. Pretty strong era. Yeah, Especially I mean, for the songs that's the pro- that's probably the strongest era around then, and American Beauty and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, classic. And then live too, they were like firing on all cylinders in the early seventies too. Yeah, even when Pigpen wasn't really firing on all cylinders, they were totally. They sounded really good, solid back then. Yeah, I mean, Europe seventy two. That's like they're iconic. Good. Yeah, tell me a little bit about the San Francisco music scene. So, you were. Coming up there, like, in the 90s, early 2000s? What was your... No. Well, let's see. Um, It was the later... So I was not planning on a career in music at all whatsoever. Okay. Um, I went to school. I studied environmental studies. Um, I thought I was going to go into a line of, like, environmental law or something like that. And I had... I broke my foot really badly um, my senior year, my junior year of college, senior year of college. And I had, I graduated from college and I had to get a surgery, which took a really long time to recover from. And I wasn't going to be like going out in the field doing any environmental stuff. And my dad suggested. You were in San Francisco still? Yes. Yeah. Um, my dad suggested that I get a teaching credential. So I went back to school. Mm. I got a teaching credential, K through five. This I whole s- time you're not playing music? No, not playing okay. music. I no. mean, I owned a guitar. Okay. You know, but I was, and I was playing in my bedroom, but I was not playing no gigs, music. No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. No. I um, went back to school, got a teaching credential. Out of college, this was probably 2002. Yeah. Out of college, it was really hard to find a teaching job. And the only job I could find was working as a teacher's assistant at an autistic school. Okay. And it was amazing, but it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, I give teachers, I think teachers should be making as much as doctors. Like, mm-hmm. it's insane 
how hard it is to be a teacher, especially to special ed, which I had no training in special ed. So I, oh my God. I got super spooked and I was like, this is too much. I can't, I can't do this. this. Right. So I went back to like my comfort zone, which is horses. And I got a job working Whoa. at a private ranch in Rancho Santa Fe. I was living in San Diego at the time. Did you grow up around horses yes, or something? You were like on a ranch or something? No, I just grew up riding. Okay. Um, hunter jumper world. I was yeah. really into it. I loved, wow. I mean, it's, that's intense. Yeah. It's where I got like every scrap of confidence I have was from horses Amazing. and I was very dedicated to it. So I got a job working as a groom um, and taking care. I was really a barn manager, taking care of about eight horses at the time, and I loved it. It was amazing. That's such a left turn from what you were doing right yeah. before that. Yeah, I mean, I've always had kind of like environment teaching horses. Those were like my yeah. my avenues. And um, I'd go to see shows. I'd go to see live shows. You know, you were interested I loved in music. music. Like, yeah. Yes. And anytime I would go see a show, I always wanted to be like closer to the stage or behind the stage. Like I didn't know what that feeling was, but it was like very strong. Um, well, and what were the what was the scene going like? Were there bands that you would like to go and see on a regular basis? In yeah. Those years in that area. Totally. I mean, so the Mother Hips were probably one of my right. favorite bands yeah. at the time. And that's kind of when my world changed is they played a New Year's Eve show in San Diego at the Casbah and invited me back to a party. And we were passing around the guitar and it landed in my lap and I was drunk enough to play a song. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tim, the front man of the Mother Hips, was like, I didn't know you sang. Come to San Francisco. Let's make a record. And that's like Whoa. literally how it started. What did you started. sing? Um, I sang Statesboro Blues. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Allman Brothers. All right. Easy blues song. Yeah. I'm not a great guitar player, you know, so I always revert to the blues. It's my comfort zone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's crazy. And so that's what happened. So you did? You went and made a record? So I did, yeah. And I kind of left and I was like, eh, whatever. That was cool. It felt good that he, you know, took note of my voice and was interested in me as a singer, but I never thought he would call. I kind of just left that party being like, oh, that was cool. Good mm. way to start the new year. Yeah. And uh, he did call, mm -hmm. and he asked when I was coming to San Francisco next, and I said, I don't have any plans. And he said, well, I think you should, because we should start tracking some some songs. Okay. So I did. Wow. And my family was up in San Francisco, so... Where were you at this time? I was in San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so does did he have a studio or something? Or? He had a little... It was his... It was a... It was a basement apartment of a beautiful house in the Cow Hollow area of San Francisco that his friend owned, and he had his living quarters and his studio was all one. Okay. Um, and he called it Pacific Dust. Pacific Dust. Yeah. And... I mean, like, the drums were in the kitchen of the yeah. studio apartment. Okay. You know, it was, like, tiny. Right. Yeah. And you cut the whole record that way. Yeah. In that one place. Yeah. Is that, that the first Nikki Bloom record? Or? Yes, that's <clears throat> okay. uh, Toby's song. It was my first right. record. And that's like 08 or? Yes, like exactly. That. Wow, that's crazy. So that came out, and then like, were you suddenly, hey, I'm going to go on tour? Like, how does that even no. translate to you? No. So I, so when I, so I mean, it How did you know how to put a record out? Well, I mean, I didn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved to San Francisco because okay. Tim and I's relationship developed. Yeah. And um, this was who you ended up marrying. This is who I ended up marrying. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> and we made that record. And when it was finished, I wanted to play a show and I wanted the show to sound like the record. Yeah. So I put a band together, which included my childhood friend, Darren Nay, um, Steve Adams, a uh, bass player of ALO, Mike Curry, Tim Bloom, and actually, I'm not even sure that Steve. Anyway, the early you know lineup of the band was put together for that show. And so was played... that the first time you'd ever been on stage? Yes, I think so. Holy shit, that's crazy. I think crazy. so. I might have played uh, some like you know no I had like done some open mics and okay. you know maybe opened. Um, a show as like a, a solo artist or a duo, but yeah, I was super green. Yeah, super green. And we played the show, and it was super fun. Where? What, what um, was the venue? Cafe du Nord. Yeah. In San Francisco, 
which I don't even know if it was there, if it's there anymore, but it was a really fun little room to play. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we just, you know, played the show. And I was at the time teaching in San Francisco. I had moved up there. Mm -hmm. I was teaching environmental ed um, at out a, at Fort Funston. At a high school or something? No, elementary. It was oh. like a, um, a star uh, school program where we went to underserved schools in the district and taught them environmental ed. Okay. Um, it, was, it was great. It was a really fun, rewarding job. It was really hard because working with... Uh, with youth is is hard, as I mentioned. <laughs> Tell me um, and then I started, you know, I gave up that job and I started substitute teaching because that would allow me more flexibility, you know. Um, and I was subbing and trying to continue playing shows. And when the scales tipped, um, and I, you know, was so were you touring? Touring more, like regionally or nationally? Regionally, um, it's like. Northern California. Yeah, Northern California. I mean, I, I give a lot of credit to Tim in forcing me to tour because I didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> and he was like, it was really when we made my second record, Driftwood, um, in 2011, yeah. that he was like, you need to tour. And I remember okay. just being really overwhelmed. Like, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know. You didn't have like a management or agent or meant. anything like that? or you I had an agent early on, Joshua Knight. He's now at Wasserman, which was Paradigm, which was Monterey International. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Joshua really took me under his wing. God bless him. Um, and I, you know, I, I was with him for many, many years. We just parted ways um, because, you know, he got so busy with so many artists. But he was like a really early believer in me, and I still love him. He's like a brother. Um, he started booking shows for me, and I learned how to tour, and I was terrified. And, you know, I just, like, Touring with a full band? Out. Or Touring just... with a full band. Okay. That's yeah. hard. After Driftwood came out. Um, Around 11, 12, 2011, 12. Yep, kinda. yep. We just got in the van, and we just started doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know. And at that point, were you getting out of California? We were doing a lot in California. I'm trying to think. We were doing a lot of touring. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we were on the road a lot. When you tour out west, any musician can tell, touring musician can tell you this. It's like the drives are incredibly long. It's not like being in the southeast I'm from Canada. or tell being me about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like your drives can be long. Yeah. And we started doing this thing on tour where we would be super bored and we'd record uh, learn like songs from our youth that were nostalgic and we would record versions of cool. them in our van. Yeah. You know, I'd put like the iPhone on the rear view mirror and <laughs> we would play, you know, cover songs with these little instruments in the van as we were driving along and yeah. going from show to show. And um, we had some really weird, random attention with that. We did a Hollow Note song. And oh, okay. So you were putting them up on YouTube. Putting them up on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Really? Okay. And what, were, what were some of the other ones that you did? We did, um, I mean, we, we've done Whitney Houston, Pat Benatar, um, Bobby Darin, Grateful Dead. Uh, so I mean, there's like driving, 35. Everyone else is arranging. A yeah, I'm of... driving. <laughs> and so we would turn the iPhone microphone to be on yeah. the driver's side. And then we would literally <laughs> mix the sound by moving, moving people. people. Yeah. yeah. It was actually really fun. And I can't believe how good it sounds considering you know right. the, it's just an iphone it's Sometimes crazy those things sound pretty good i mean it's not good enough to like you know we we thought for a while oh maybe we should like take these and put them make a record make a record but no, no they're not that good yeah. <laughs> it's but on the YouTube, spirit they, they sound fun yeah and it's the spirit of yeah. it you know it was fun i remember people being like that's dangerous. And I'm thinking to myself, do you oh, not sing when you drive? Is that, you're not using your mouth at the steering wheel. Yeah. And I was always driving. So was that something that got you a lot of attention? I was not aware yes. that you, okay. So yeah. that was like a thing. So that, that was, was thing. why, yes, because, okay. because John Oates saw it. God bless him. I love you, John Oates. He saw it and Twitter at the time was like, all the thing and I think he tweeted it and then oh, it wow. was like okay. the power of social media it was like Cameron Crowe retweeted it and Bette Midler retweeted oh it my God. And, uh, Anthony Mason calls and we're suddenly on you know the morning show and then we're on Conan and it was crazy and that's what demanded us to go to stuff. all from that stuff oh my god that's nuts that's what demanded us to start touring nationally 
because we would start getting offers in like Birmingham. We're like, Birmingham? Well, if we're going to drive all the way out to Birmingham, we better string it together. And that's what made us start so touring you did outside Conan California. show based off of these I mean, videos? No, I mean, we, we were working really hard. Yeah. We were touring a lot. We were doing a residency in San Francisco. We were playing kind of nonstop. I mean, we really want, we were, we had that little kickstart from the cover songs, but we were really adamant about redirecting people to our original right. music. Sort of like Lake Street Dive in a way, I guess. Very much so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Did you see that? translate to like bigger crowds like exponentially as the attention grew for that stuff you know this is where it just gets so slippery and there's no like linear way to music we we for a while you know people would come and i think people would come thinking that we were going to do a lot more covers than we did and we were really adamant about not doing covers And, you know, we would, like, maybe do one or maybe we would go to the merch table and do, like, one acoustically and people loved it. But mm-hmm. it really didn't – it really didn't last. Right. It, it didn't. Um, yeah, you don't want to be saddled with that thing as no. your career. That's no. for sure. No. So you have to kind of probably just put a line in the sand and say, yep. it's not what we're doing. Here. And you have to think, too, you know, like, that was a really um, – the eyes on on the YouTube stuff was a lot of people like in their office sitting at their desk passing it around. It's not like live music goers. It was yeah. just this really weird blip phenomenon thing Crazy. that happened. So was this Nikki Bloom or was this Gramblers or what? This was, was Nikki Bloom and the Gramblers. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. So we kind of rode that out, and you know we did what we could with it. We made uh, two records, yep. self-titled Nikki Bloom and the Gramblers, and then a record called Loved Wild Lost, and continued touring, um, you know, and we were we were really wanting to, you know, to go at it. Um, things changed, everything, you know, good comes to an end. The inner workings of our world and the dynamics started to change. My marriage sort of started to, you know, get strained, and so... You know, it, it had its time, mm-hmm. and it was a really fun time. Did you eventually just say, that's the end of this band, I'm not doing this anymore? Or like, it just Was there an, a finite ending to it? I was going through a lot personally. You know, Tim was my my mentor and my, my partner, yeah. and, you know, I considered him the band leader, and I looked to him for a lot of you know, um, guidance, and he was also my main writing partner. And when our relationship sort of disintegrated, I I kind of lost my musical partner and my writing partner. And at the time, my management said, why don't you start going out to Nashville and write with writers? Yeah. And I didn't really know that this world existed. I didn't realize that, you know, co-writing is a thing and you come here and you do it. And so I came out on a couple trips, and I actually stayed in this neighborhood. I stayed at oh, Langhorn yeah. Slim's house, and um, this loved is like it. around 2015-ish. This is 2016. Okay. Yeah, 2016. Um, and I came to Nashville in the spring, and it's like lovely. Yeah, easy to fall in love. 16 days. Everything's <laughs> blooming, and everything's gorgeous, and you know, the walkability of East Nashville. I mean, I was just like, what is this place? This is amazing. And you get to go and write with people and it's free. And I feel like I'm going to therapy sessions. And I ended up finishing writing for my record that I would then move on to record in Memphis with Matt Rossbang. And we made a record called To Rise, You Gotta Fall, just as I had moved to Nashville. So when I moved to Nashville, I basically went straight into the studio down in Memphis, made that record with Matt, and that was the first break from the Gramblers, where I knew that I really wanted to go into the studio and have the only baggage I brought in be the words on the page, because Mm -hmm. my songs were so topical, and they were filled with so much pain um, through my transition, you know, out of my marriage and getting a divorce and just, you know, you're in a band for 10 years. There's like drama that ensues. It's inevitable. Um, and I just had a lot of, of pain. And I felt really strongly at the time that it was scarier to stay in the known Mm -hmm. than it was to step into the unknown. And that's when I just was like, I need to move. I need to 
record my record, I needed a clean slate. I really did. It was just, it was all so painful. Did you ha- did you ever have any like real confidence issues with like writing in particular? Um, having, you know, years where you had co-writer slash mentor or whatever with Tim to suddenly kind of being on your own as far as the creative process goes was that like ever a problem for you yeah I mean it still is yeah like I constantly am doubting myself Um, my inner critic is really strong and my work now (laughs) is to like be nice to myself and you know you want to have a bit of the inner critic turned on because you don't want to churn out shit but you also (laughs) need to have like a kindness yeah you know in yourself so yeah I mean that's that's definitely you know a a work in progress. I think that's like life work, you know? Um, And it's hard to write a great song. It really is. And, you know, I found some incredible writing partners, Jesse being one. I love writing with Kai, Mm -hmm. Um, you know. Was that stuff that was set up like through your label or publisher or anything like that? Or were you kind of of organically finding all those co-writing people? For my last record, To Rise, You Gotta Fall, I was set up on rights. Um, okay. Simon Gugela was probably my favorite person to write with. He mm-hmm. helped me work through so many challenging issues. And I just remember showing up at his house to write and, you know, sitting down with him. And we just really were conversational. We were talking about our life. And, you know, he's like, gosh, this is just so refreshing that I don't have to write a song about cars and chicks. <laughs> And I was like, really? That's what you do? And so Simon, to yeah, Simon was was a great um, early co-write experience for me. And you know, now um, as I am deeper into the community and I've made friends, it's it's a lot more organic of mm-hmm. a writing process. But I would love to, you know, discipline myself more and and start to be set up on rights and. Mm-hmm you know, get back into that world post COVID because I think it's good to be uncomfortable and I think it's good to broaden your scope of people and, you know, it's fun. I like co-writing. I think that it's fun to get people's perspective and I love when it can be conversational and That's cool. It's not for everybody. It's cool that you dig it. I do. I mean, you know, when it's right, I dig it. So you had a batch of songs how did you hook up with Matt? I've done some stuff with Matt. That's a that's a good little scene. He's yeah, got going over there. Ugh, did I you just work love at, um, him. Sam Phillips. We did. Yep, yeah. we worked at Sam Phillips. Um, I think my manager uh, at the time, Dan Kaysen, connected me with Matt. We just both were admirers of his work, um, the Iron and Wine record mm-hmm. that he did, and you know, um, I just knew that I wanted to, I needed to have a strong lead um and he was amazing because he put the band together yeah and all memphis people he, all memphis people except ken coomer who okay. played drums he's a nashville guy um who were the other players on that record uh dave smith played bass ken played drums will sexton played guitar oh yeah al gamble yeah. played keys and um rick stuff played okay. piano I mean, they're just, it was so fun. And they they play a lot together. So I kind of walked into this, like, very comfy right. vibe. And you guys were in that big tracking yeah. room area. Yeah. Yep, and we tracked everything live. Great. And it was Including so fun. Including my vocals, mm-hmm. which Matt would not let me replace. Right. Yep. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> which, you know, that whole thing, that was the first time I ever really had fun recording because it was not overthought. It was not sitting at a computer. Right. It was not sh- cutting stuff up. It was like organic and it was fun. And it was, it really was the, f- it, I can't even tell you how cathartic that process was for me. Coming out of the situation that I was in and going into Matt Rossbang's happy go lucky vibe. Yes. <laughs> he was the perfect person for me at that time in my life. And yeah. he put together the perfect band. And I will always be. So filled with gratitude for that time in That's my life. It's great to have like a really accurate snapshot too of like yeah. that time. So did you do it all in like four or five days kind of thing? Or? I think the band tracked for, I think we had the band for seven days, maybe 10 days. And then okay. I think I stayed an extra week and, you know, did we did stuff. overdubs yeah. and we had Sam Shoup come in and arrange, you know, strings and, you know, Amazing. we put all the icing on and I yeah. stayed for all of that. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's quite a scene. Have you seen his new place? We saw it when it wasn't done. So okay. I need to, I'm due for a, a visit to him to see the finished product. That's a, such a crazy place. The, I know. What is it called? Is it Crossroads? No. Cross oh, town? yeah, yeah, yeah. Cross Cro um, the something? whole building. And then yeah. he's calling his place oh, yeah, Southern has he Groove. Decided? Southern Groove. Oh, Southern Groove. Okay. Last time I talked to him, it was unclear. Yep. Me too. I know. Southern Groove. Okay. Yeah. And it's awesome. It looks awesome. And he has such great taste in like yeah. colors and furniture. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I want to go there. Yeah, me too. I was there too also when it was not finished. I mixed a thing with him last year and we did it at Sam Phillips. It was one of the last things he did there before he moved. But I did get to see the new place in sort of three quarters completion yeah. mode, yeah. which is cool. So cool. So that's a totally different experience for you. And then the new record was again like a completely obviously different experience because of the whole COVID situation. Totally. Um, so going forward, if you're going to make another record, how would, you, I mean, you've done it all. How would you approach, do you think? Or do you, have you started another record or anything like that? Um, it's a little early probably. Well, we actually did just start tracking yesterday, just a demo. Oh, yeah. um, you know, w w Jesse and I are, are are building a studio at our house. It'll be a modest studio, but it should be enough that we can, you know. So what's that going to look like? Make Is records. It, um, in the house? It's a detached garage that we're converting. Um, kind of like this place. Yeah, it's not quite as nice <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, One you know, floor, so two many car resources. Garage kind of vibe? It's two, it's two floors. So it's okay. a two car garage. And then they had an attic that was really meant for storage. Yeah. And I bit off a bit more than I could chew. I got um, a contractor, Don Corey, in town to help me build out the attic. Um, and oh, so that's done. The attic is done. So we've got like the tra we've got the control room, okay. which is now control room slash live room. Like there's drums. Like it's way too up crowded there. up right. there right now because we need to do the downstairs, and the downstairs will be the live room. But downstairs it's all wired. Is currently, just a big garage. Empty big space. garage. Okay. Yeah. But we did we did have the foresight to you know create uh, yeah. wire drops. Yeah. So um, you know ideally it would be it would be that. Um, but I do love the collaborative effort. So you know I don't know I don't know if it would and I would love to work with Matt again in some way shape or form. You know I don't know I'm I'm not sure I haven't figured it out. But what I love about working with both Matt and Jesse is Matt has this like Memphis thing, obviously, yes. and Jesse has this California thing. Yes. And I feel like the California Memphis, I sort of joked around and was like, it's like Cali Memphis is my sound. You know, people are always like begging for you to tell them what your music sounds like and right, what the genre right. is. And I hate that yeah. because it's just impossible, but it's like that California Memphis vibe. I, I really that. like, I really, I hear that on, on the new record for sure. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad. Cali Memphis, that's the genre. <laughs> I mean, there's soul, there's country, there's yeah. all that stuff. It's yeah. all mixed in there. Yeah. But 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 my point is I love to do things from the comfort of home because I love how easy it is to just organically be mm. like, you want to let's go track. Let's go you So know. is the intention for that place that you're building to just do your own stuff in or is it going to be like a commercial space of some sort? It won't be your... commercial, but you know, Jesse's already working on like three more records, okay. um, friends. Yeah. Um, he's working with Zach Schmidt, who's a local artist here. Who's fantastic. Um, he just, um, finished doing some stuff with Austin Gillette, who's mm -hmm. actually a pro skateboarder and also musician, Amazing. Jesse and, and Dom Billet and, and Austin just finished making a record. So, you know, little projects yeah. of friends and stuff he believes in. And, right. you know, he's also an artist in his own right. And he's constantly working. He's constantly up there, probably the same way you are. You know, he, he doesn't turn it off. So I just need to go up there and knock on the door and be like, can we work on one of mine? <laughs> it's kind of like that. Okay. And, and are you a prolific writer or does it take you forever? Or what's your situation? You know, I'm, I'm a prolific jotter downer. Okay. Of Do you have a lot of notebooks? Ideas. I have a lot of, of notebooks and I have a lot of like memos. song starts, tons of voice memos. I actually just was sitting on the airplane and the Wi-Fi wasn't working, so I couldn't watch anything and I didn't feel like reading. And so I just started going through my voice memos. And 
I like always I think like six ah. albums there. On yeah, there. I'm like I always think I haven't done anything or written anything, and I'm always like lashing myself for not being disciplined enough. And then I go into my voice memos, and I have like all this cool shit, and I'm yep. like, oh, I just need to develop this that I already have, and you know. I love that about voice memos in that you can jot something down, forget about it for a year, and then like that time that forgetting it and that distance you are from something that you were working on for a day or something a year ago can really give you a different perspective on it that you might have totally. originally just wanted to give up on or something but it totally or you don't think it's good and then you have space and you're like wait Actually. did I do that that's cool <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good yeah so, so you have a lot of that kind of stuff I have a lot of that kind of stuff um it actually do you labor over stuff to finish it or do you like, um lyrically maybe okay. um only because you know I used to be like okay cool yeah that's good that's good and now that I'm in Nashville I feel like I have a more critical eye on myself mm -hmm. where I will spend more time just wanting to distill distill mm -hmm. distill be more exact you know, harness bigger uh, concepts into yeah. tidy, you know, mm -hmm. neat songs. I, I, I want to cut the fat, so I'm always trying to do that. Do, um, you, do you write songs to pitch to other people? I would like to. Um, you haven't done that before, though. I don't have a publishing deal right now, okay. so I'm, I'm sort of looking for something like that, um, you know, it would be nice. I would be very open to it. And that's the beauty of the, the studio, too. I would love to get assignments and, right. you know, I can do it. I, you know, I I've got you this yeah. amazing, uh, you know, community of, of people um, that I love to work with. And we've got the studio space. So yeah. I'm open to all things. You're into it. I'm into it. Let me just ask you about something you were talking about before, which I know you can't give the details on, but the, the movie thing that you were doing with Blake Mills. So how does something like that come ab come ab about? Like, did Blake have that project and call you, or did you, like, what was the process for that? That's such a crazy thing. Well, this is so mysterious <laughs> because it's it's so weird. Like, you never really know, right? But, like, I think maybe what happened was during the pandemic, the Band of Heathens were doing a weekly... A good time supper club where they would do like a variety show online and okay. i would always be a guest and sing on that variety show yeah and um james petrale was a guest on that show one week of white denim and james is the male vocal mm -hmm. for this said television show. Oh, okay. So he already had that gig. Yes. Okay. And he was friends, is friends with the Band of Heathens. And I think he was talking to one of the guys, maybe Trevor Nealon in the band. And maybe he had heard me sing on the show. And maybe he recommended me to Blake. I don't really know. I don't actually really know. But the weird thing is that I just got a call from Tony Berg. So my phone rang with Tony Berg's number. And Did you know Tony I Berg? met Tony because I was going to do my record with Tony oh. in 2017. Okay. And then Ryan Adams came in and said he wanted to do my record. And he totally messed my life up for a second. But I turned down Tony because I thought Ryan was going to do my record. And, and then, then he, Ryan did his whole Ryan thing. And I don't know what the Ryan disappeared. thing is. He just like gives you a the run around. around and, yeah. Okay. He gave me the run around. And that's how I ended up with Matt Rossbank. Wow, crazy. Which is a blessing. I mean, it's like sometimes, you know, the unanswered prayers are like the best thing in the Why world. Why didn't you go back to Tony Berg? I think that that ship had sailed. Yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. But so it was cool to see Tony's name pop up on my phone. Okay. And I was like, oh, cool, so all these him, years later. Right. And he, he was just like, Nikki, I've got the weirdest gig for you. You're never going to believe this. And that's how it happened. And was he f involved in the project? So Tony and Blake share studio space. space. Right, okay. And, I mean, I think Tony was, like, Blake's first, you know, like, supporter. I mean, I remember Tony talking about Blake back in, you know, 2015. Um, I met Blake when he was 12. Yeah. I, I was mean, Tony <laughs> was, like, to Tony's been singing Blake's praises for 
years and years and years and years. So yes, Tony was invo involved with the project, but not on my side of it. I worked directly with with Blake and Joseph Lorge, his engineer. And the space, is it in Tony's house? No, it's Sound City. Sunset? Oh, it's Sound City. So they have... Is that like, right? Or Sunset Sound? I can't remember. I always get No, I think confused. you're right. I think it's Sound City. So they have like a half of the studio or something? No, they have the whole studio. The whole thing. Um, Blake is in Studio A and Tony's in Studio B. They're just in there all the time. Yeah. That's crazy. They both show up in their matching uh, Teslas. <laughs> it's hilarious. Of course. They're amazing. They're, the scene they have over there is just like so cool and fun. Is it just fun. a hive of craziness? Um, no, I mean, they're, they, they're super pro. They're very, but they're like, they keep regular working hours. Busy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Constantly busy. So he, so Blake was doing the score for the show. Yes. Okay. And this was like just something that was getting done for the show. And you were working on that for how long? Three weeks. Whoa. Three weeks I was in LA. It was Crazy. so fun. I yeah. loved it. I loved it gig. so much. And that's the other thing. I would love to get more studio work. I yeah. mean, that would really be, because I don't, you know, I feel like the pandemic did one of two things for touring musicians. Either it made you really hungry for the road, or it made you really realize that you like sleeping in your own bed and having yeah. pets in a garden, yeah. and I'm the latter. Okay. So I would love to get more studio work, okay. because I love singing. I love singing on other people's stuff. You I do, love eh? singing okay. harmony. Yeah. I love I love singing in the studio. And now that we're set up, you know, I can do it remotely. I could do it in town. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Putting it out there. Good to know. Yeah, put it, <laughs> put it into the universe. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and the touring thing for you, are you doing it at all these yeah. days? Yes. You are. Okay. Yeah. And what does that look like for you? Um, so I've just decided to be really particular about what I do and what I don't. You know, I only want to do stuff that I feel really excited about. Yeah. Um, I'm opening a bunch of shows for Little Feet this that. fall. That's crazy. Which I'm really excited about because I love them and I love their Does music. Does that also go back to the whole Phil world? Um, like what's, do you have a connection with them? I went to Jamaica with Little Feet. They put on a festival and they put me on their festival. Okay. And Bill Payne and I became friends because yeah. Bill is the coolest guy in the world. Yeah, he's super cool. And I love him. He's and been on the show. He's amazing. Yeah. And he and I became friends. And this is really funny. So they came to uh, they were they came to Nashville this summer to play two nights at the Ryman. And my friend Connor Kennedy, who is from Woodstock, was like, hey, can I come stay with you? I'm gonna come down and see Little Feet. Um, I might be singing with them. Actually, Bill was thinking that like he might want you to come and sing, BGVs at those shows, are you gonna be home? And I was like, well, yeah, I'll be home. I was actually in Colorado at the time and I was flying back to Nashville. And I get on my plane, like, the next day after I had talked to Connor, and who am I sitting next to on my Come airplane? On. And it's, like, assigned seats, united assigned seats. I'm sitting next to Bill Payne. I sit down Come next to Bill now. Payne. He looks at me and he goes, Nikki, I've been meaning to call you. And I'm like, <laughs> Bill, I can't even believe this is happening. So oh anyway, it's just the universe really it does work in funny, that mysterious ways. So yeah, so then he ended up saying, can you come and sing with us? Mm -hmm. You know, we're taping these shows. That um, was the, were those the Waiting for Columbus yes. shows? Yes. Cool. Yeah. 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 What'd you sing? Um, I sang backgrounds oh, on backups, all, all of them. Okay. And then I came up and sang Willin with Jamie Johnson, nice. which I think is the one they put on the, on the recording. Uh, so on the, what's the happening tape. with it? It's a, it's a live album or what? Um, yeah, it's a live album and it's okay. out. And it's also DVD. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You can get it at littlefeet.com. Okay. So that'll be fun. So touring, you know, I, I'm I'm excited to go out and do really So you're opening that I, for the feet and singing with them? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, and do you go out with a full band or just This will be a duo. It'll be me okay. and Jesse. Okay. Um, actually, Kai and I did a couple this summer as a duo. And it was just, it was really fun, you know, go out there for 30 minutes and 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 play songs from the new record and yep. you know i i would like to do maybe like a west coast run or um something but, in the, but in you're the not spring burning to go out and hit the road i'm not i'm not okay you know i i would like to play where there's demand but i don't want to force it and um you know it's it's rough I was in a van for 10 years with a bunch of dudes and and it was amazing and i loved <laughs> i loved it um, but I'm not chomping at the it. bit to like yeah. go do that in that capacity. 
you know. You know, you're always worrying about ticket sales and did we sell enough? You're always getting pressure. Steve Polt says it great. He's like, God, on my tombstone, it's going to (laughs) say, we need to sell more tickets. You know, it's just like it's very stressful and it's very hard on your ego to constantly put yourself in that position, you know. It's just, you know, I've learned I want to protect my my inner landscape and, you know, make it a hospitable place for me to live. And, And when I'm, you know, constantly putting it out there, it's crazy because musicians are, I think, depending on the kind of musicians, we're all pretty like introverted people, right? Thoughtful, thinking, you know, people. And then you're asked to like, go beyond this stage and go wear all of these hats and go be this extrovert. And you see the kind of wear, physical, mental, emotional wear it puts on, on people. So I'm just, you know, the reality is like, yes, I have to tour to a degree, but I would love to do, you know, 60 dates a year instead of 200, you know? So finding balance, that's what I'm looking for. I think that's what we're all looking for in some kind of way. Especially as you get older, Yeah, you know? It's like you have loved ones and you have kids or pets or whatever. It's like, you know, quality of life. Well, thanks for um, doing this today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I know, I feel like we've, we've just been, I just made a new friend. All right, folks, thanks so much for listening. That was my conversation with Nikki Bloom. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks for another chilling episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. We'll see you then. Music Makers and Soul Shakers is produced at the Hen House Studio in Nashville, Tennessee by Steve Dawson. Please remember to subscribe to the show and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can find more info on this episode, including show notes and an audio playlist at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thanks again to our amazing sponsors this season, Ear Trumpet Labs, Union Tube and Transistor, Black Mountain Picks, Isotope, and Spectra 1964. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Music